big thanks to Sega for sponsoring this video. Space. It's rough out here, man. You got ruthless space pirates making life miserable, breeding deadly Metroids to control the galaxy. This Galactic Federation? Pretty much useless. Luckily, we have Sam as Eren, the legendary galactic bounty hunter who successfully cripples the space pirates and exterminates the Metroids. Except for this cute baby one here, she couldn't bring herself to kill it. So she decides to bring it to researchers to look into how this baby Metroid might benefit the galaxy. And lo and behold, the space pirates come back to steal it and restart their plans. She shut them down by going directly to their home base and wrecking all of them, taking out their commanders Kraid, Fantoon, Dragon, and Ridley, the monster responsible for destroying her home and killing her parents. And their leader? a creepy organic AI called Mother Brain, who came dangerously close to ending Samus for good, until the baby Metroid sacrificed itself to save her. This allows Samus to turn the tables, destroy Mother Brain, and Zebus goes up in smoke along with it. This was the ending to 1994's Super Metroid. It felt like a perfect ending. The galaxy should finally be at peace, right? Wrong. But how do you continue a series called Metroid without Metroids? Enter Metroid Other M, released in 2010 for the Nintendo Wii. It promised to explore Samus' story in ways that we haven't seen before, digging into her backstory, her emotional struggles, and hinting at new characters to expand the lore. It looked like we were going to get a deeper glimpse into who Samus really is, but things didn't turn out exactly as expected. Up to that point, the Metroid Prime games had become their own saga, set between the original Metroid for NES and Metroid 2 Return of Samus, without really touching on what happens to Samus after Super Metroid. So story-wise, there wasn't much that explored her life after Zebus exploded. But that's where Metroid Fusion comes in. Released in 2002 for the Game Boy Advance, it would be the first game to explore Samus' life after Super Metroid. But for this video, we're going to do things a bit differently. Other M takes place right after Super Metroid and before Fusion, so we'll start there. And despite all the hype after its reveal at E3 2009, it became one of the most controversial Metroid titles ever. So let's dive into the Metroid games that shaped a more seasoned Samus Aran, the controversies that followed, and the rebirth of the series as we know it. Welcome to Mentoctober. Metroid. Hey kid, don't listen to that other ad. Instead, check out Sonic X Shadow Generations with the referral link below. You know what that X stands for? Extreme! Oh wait, it doesn't? It's time for classic and modern Sonic to reunite at a remastered collection of legendary 2D and 3D levels, plus an all-new standalone Shadow campaign. Play as the ultimate life form, Shadow the Hedgehog, as he confronts his dark past and puts the chaos fear into the hearts of his enemies. Harness chaos control and unleash Shadow's epic new Doom powers like the Doom Morph and Doom Wing to conquer your new platforming challenges and defeat the nefarious Black Doom. Or spin dash with modern and classic Sonic to save their friends scattered across space and time. A greatest hits collection of stages from past Sonic games now with updated visuals, the drop dash for classic Sonic, rework cinematics, and other exciting updates. It's a definitive blend of classic Sonic, modern Sonic, and Shadow gameplay, bringing more high-speed action to your screens. So Kit, are you up for the ultimate challenge? Click that link below and get your copy of Sonic X Shadow Generations right now! Or Sega may never call me again! Okay, Samus. Everything's normal. Other M opens with a recap of Super Metroid's ending, the death of the baby Metroid still haunting Samus as she awakens on a Federation ship for a quick checkup and mission briefing. The opening is meant to mirror Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion with Samus as the narrator, but for the first time, she's fully voiced, played by actress Jessica Martin. I awoke to the familiar voice of a quarantine officer. I had been reliving the tragic moments of my recent past. Sure, we've heard grunts and voice clips in the Prime series before, but here she lays it all out, describing her emotions throughout the game and dropping the stoic mask that we're used to. Other M's biggest gamble was reimagining Samus as emotionally vulnerable, trading the stoic hunter for someone with deeply personal struggles. Unfortunately, the transition from silent strength to verbal introspection alienated fans instead of deepening their connection to her. But we'll get to that in a bit. Since the Zebus incident, the galaxy seems to have moved on in a matter of days, forgetting about the space pirates and Metroids like they were last season's memes. Samus saved the galaxy and everybody's too busy binging the latest Talk to a podcast to care. But suddenly Samus receives a distress call from a deserted space vessel called the Bottle Ship, and she quickly heads off to investigate. But it turns out this ship isn't so deserted. The Galactic Federation's 7th Platoon is present, where Samus reunites with some of her old buddies from her time in the military. Remember me? 
No. This is Anthony Higgs, the best character in this game. I mean, look at this chat. And rounding out the crew are Lyle Smithsonian, Maurice Favreau, James Pierce, and Keiji Misawa. We'll also meet Adam Malkovich, Samus's old commanding officer and hands down the worst character in this franchise. Right away, he's a dick, calling her an outsider. And Samus immediately lets us know that this hurts her feelings. Why do you care what this dickhead thinks, Samus? But Adam eventually gives in and allows her to cooperate under the condition that he is in command. You don't move unless I say so, and you don't fire until I say so. And she agrees. From the start, the game's biggest issue becomes apparent. Samus, who single-handedly wiped out space pirates and annihilated an entire alien species, is hung up on what this asswipe thinks of her. And the reason she can't use her suit's full powers is because Adam hasn't authorized it. Before we continue, I want to say I will give this story a fair shot and play devil's advocate on these narrative choices a little later in the video. Anyway, Adam doesn't disclose why the team is there, but we find out there are monsters on the ship, so Samus jumps in to help them investigate. And things get a little weird, like the appearance of this space pirate with a Galactic Federation insignia on its chest. Samus will discover that the bottle ship was being used to create bioweapons, headed up by one Dr. Madeline Bergman. And given how bioweapons usually go in this series, it's not looking good. So the mission? Find Dr. Bergman, figure out what's going on, and eliminate the threats on board. Like this aggressive lizard thing flying around that attacks Samus, and though her and Anthony manage to scare it off, there will be no shortage of horrors like this awaiting them within the ship. Oh, and poor Lau here got got. He looks like a pile of rags. What's gotta happen to a guy to make him look like that? Really, nigga? Samus heads to Sector 2, the ice level of the game, looking for survivors and stumbles upon a grim scene. Maurice, folded like laundry. And a woman is also here who doesn't stick around to answer any questions, but when Samus catches up to her, she reveals that Maurice was shot by one of his own squad mates. So the plot thickens. There's a mole on board, now called the Deleter. But before Samus can get any more answers, they get assaulted by the Deleter, his head conveniently off screen, of course, which leads to a boss fight with an excavator. Or at least that's what I think this thing is. Of course, once you destroy it, the Deleter escapes. So with nothing else to go on, Samus continues to track down the lizard monster, pairing off with Anthony in the pyrosphere sector of the ship. It's here that she reveals the memory with the platoon that influenced her to go solo. During a rescue mission, Adam made the choice to leave his brother Ian behind. A ship they were towing in space was going critical while Ian attempted to repair it. But with no other choice, Adam had to cut the ship loose to save the many, while Samus is pleading and begging to let her go into the ship to save Ian. During her narration, she acknowledges that Adam made the right choice, and it was unlikely she was able to save Ian, but this incident started a grudge against Adam, and she promptly left the Galactic Federation army to go be a total badass. If it wasn't for our boy Ian, Samus would still be with this loser group. Anyway, we return to the present, and Samus manages to find that lizard monster, but the truth hits hard. It's Ridley. But wait, doesn't this mean that this is a new Ridley? And when Samus sees Ridley in his newly matured form, it triggers this intense PTSD episode. In this infamous scene, she freezes in terror as memories of their past encounters overwhelm her. Anthony tries to distract the beast, but it costs him his life. RIP to the real MVP. And snap back to reality, Samus fights Ridley, but before she can finish him off, he escapes. So let's recap here. We're on a compromised research ship that's been working on dangerous bioweapons. The person in charge of the project is missing. There are pirates branded with the Galactic Federation insignia. Samus's old platoon came to investigate for reasons unknown and is being killed off one by one, presumably by a traitor called the Deleter. And meanwhile, Samus is running around with no clue of what's going on. If this narrative feels more convoluted to you than other Metroid games we've covered, that's because it is. And this was an intentional move, with the team aiming to craft a more cinematic experience, but the result is... complicated. So while Samus continues to investigate the bottle ship, let's shed some light on how this game was made. We gotta travel back to E3 2009. Retro Studios had wrapped up their Dark Samus and Phazon saga two years earlier with Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, tying everything up with a nice bow. It was revealed that Retro shifted focus to Donkey Kong Country Returns, 
but Metroid fans wouldn't have to wait very long for the next entry. So at E3 2009, Nintendo would reveal Metroid Other M, marketed as a more traditional Metroid game with a deeper narrative. This was a huge collaboration between Nintendo, Team Ninja of Ninja Gaiden fame, and Deep Rockets, a company that specialized in CG animation. And collectively, they would call themselves Project M. Yoshio Sakamoto, the producer behind Super Metroid, would make his return as producer for this title, but he'd also be in charge as the writer and director. Sakamoto recruited Team Ninja to help, since his own team wasn't very experienced in developing in 3D, which seems pretty far-fetched to me in the early 2000s. But with about 100 members on staff, Project M set out to create a game that would stand apart from the Metroid Prime series, focusing on simpler controls and a more personal, narrative-driven experience to shed light on Samus' character. This involves six months of work on over 300 storyboards, with 10 teams dedicated solely to just cutscenes. The amount of cutscenes here had the team counting them down to the second to make sure they all fit on the disc. Meanwhile, Team Ninja's influence can be felt in the faster combat, but merging their action-heavy style with Metroid's exploration-based gameplay left the game feeling a bit unsure of its identity. As for the simplified controls, Sakamoto aimed to create an NES game with the latest technology. This philosophy prioritized simplicity, but also limited player movement options like preventing full movement in first-person mode. Narrative-wise, the team wanted the game to take place right after Super Metroid to bridge the gap between those events and Metroid Fusion, with a plan to cement a larger narrative that would eventually follow the events of Fusion. Considering the game's ambition, the development cycle was surprisingly short, likely beginning around 2007, as they used Team Ninja's recent Ninja Gaiden games as the rubric for the combat. In theory, this all sounded great, but in practice, Other M left a lasting stain on the Metroid franchise, a chip on its shoulder that would take years to overcome. You see, up to this point, Samus was basically a silent protagonist, a stand-in for the player or portrayed as mysterious. This gave her character some mystique, but it also left room for players to fill in the gaps of her personality. With Metroid Other M, Sakamoto wanted to portray Samus as a more human character. And he said, quote, I wanted to create an intriguing depiction of Samus's humanity, showing that she's not just cool, but also kind and sympathetic, and perhaps a little immature in her passion and earnestness. Unlike typical Nintendo games, Other M placed narrative first, with gameplay designed to support the story. Sakamoto's approach was unorthodox for Nintendo and caused friction early in development, as staff found it challenging to shift from Nintendo's gameplay first mentality. Now I said I would play devil's advocate here, so hear me out. In this game, Samus takes an active narrator role, sharing her thoughts during interactions with other characters. For example, in the intro, she reflects on her somewhat motherly compassion toward the baby Metroid. Never again would I encounter the baby. Never. Which ended up spawning the whole the baby meme. Baby. The baby. And the baby. For the baby. Of the baby. For the baby. Babies cry. The baby. Babies cry. There's also her immediate shift to a more submissive role when reuniting with her old platoon. A squad that seems to have treated her more like a princess than a team member. Probably because she was the only woman on the team and much younger than the rest of them. Honestly, this is one of the more believable flaws in the game. It's kind of like how you'll always be your parents' baby. Even as an adult, being around them makes it harder to have that moment where you realize that you're the grown-up in the room now. That's the best analogy I can make at the top of my head here, and when you take a second to look at Samus as a human being in this context, I don't hate it. But the other part of me is like, it's Samus, go, go tell Adam to fuck off. Another elephant in the room is this PTSD scene with Ridley. Samus discovers that somehow Ridley is alive and well again, and freezes, putting Chad Anthony's life at risk. To give credit where it's due, the Metroid manga, one of the most definitive sources on her backstory, explains this well. I've covered it in another video if you want to check that out. But in this manga, Ridley is responsible for killing Samus's parents, destroying her home, and robbing her of her childhood. The first time she phases him after that, she has a full breakdown. It's a powerful moment that makes sense, but in Other M, years have passed and she's still having the same episodes. In defense of this scene, PTSD is complex and real people struggle with these emotions. And I think fans would have been more forgiving if Other M had portrayed a younger Samus. But the drastic transition between the silent, stoic Samus from earlier games and the vulnerable version here didn't sit right with them. And by this point, she's fought Ridley like five times. Six if you count the fight from the Metroid 2 remake, but that was added at a later date, so I won't count that here. The idea that she's still hyperventilating after annihilating him time and time again didn't land well with fans and made their favorite bounty hunter seem weak. Now, for those who defend this scene, I've seen them argue that maybe she's reacting to him always finding some way of coming back and felt helpless in that moment. 
And who knows, maybe she's been freaking out this whole time under her visor and we had no idea. Either way, it didn't sit well with the community and Sakamoto's attempt to make Samus feel more human fell flat. Some of these sentiments extended to gameplay as well, and if you've played previous 2D Metroid games, the overall structure of Other M will feel familiar. Samus explores various sectors of the battleship, including the tropical biosphere, the pyrosphere's fiery depths, and the icy cryosphere. These unique biomes kept the environments fresh. And much like any other Wii game, the motion capabilities of the Wii Remote were factored in. If the player holds it sideways, the game has the traditional third-person perspective from previous titles. But if the player points the controller at the screen, we're back in first person, so you can investigate areas of interest or point at enemies and fire missiles. Though if you're expecting this to get you Metroid Prime style gameplay, you're going to be pretty disappointed. Samus can't even move in this mode. There's also less focus on locating power-ups this time around. Narratively, this makes sense, since most power-ups Samus has collected in the past have been areas where the Chozo resided at some point. But this time, she starts fully equipped and can't use anything until Adam authorizes it. So my question is, if she has the ability to save one of Adam's crew with a restricted power-up, why wouldn't she just use it? There's no civilians around. What's the worst that could happen if she used her ice beam a little early? It feels more like Adam is on a power trip and Samus is enabling it. And that's why you'll never get me to like Adam Malkovich. Anyway, Metroid Other M released to decent reviews, currently sitting at a 79 on Metacritic. At launch, this game was averaging 8 out of 10s, with reviewers praising the simple controls and fluid gameplay. Not to mention they introduced some cool melee options for Samus, like this sense move counter or the overblast that let her hop onto enemies and just unload on them. A 79 out of 100 isn't the worst score, definitely not the best Metroid game, but not a disaster either, so why the stigma? Well, from a gameplay perspective, people weren't a fan of the first person mode, and I agree it feels a little tacked on to try to attempt to cash in on some of the previous Metroid Prime hype. But it was the narrative, script, and dialogue that really crippled the game. Critics described Samus' portrayal as boring and lifeless. The thumbs up sign had been used by the Galactic Federation for ages. Me? I was known for giving the thumbs down during briefing. I've heard it described as emotionless. It was definitely, you know, planned on sounding like that. And she's just looking back at past events. And so she is very much detached. And, um, you know, there is a little bit of remorse. The game also leaned too heavily on the plot at times, with complaints about long, unskippable cutscenes that exhausted players with repetition of obvious plot points and dialogue as mature and interesting as a teenager's diary. That's me quoting somebody, by the way. In North America, the game barely sold half a million copies, disappointing Nintendo, and years later, Reggie fils former president of Nintendo of America, reflected on the game's failure. I really thought that was going to be a defining moment for the Metroid franchise. It was giving much more of a perspective about Samus. I really thought that was going to be a killer moment in the franchise's history, and it wasn't. It didn't deliver. Not the business results. It really didn't touch the player the way we hoped it would. Personally, I rented this game the week it came out, excited to learn more about Samus, but while it didn't give me that, I still enjoyed playing it, until it just ended, right as I was starting to get into the swing of things. And years later, to me, it feels more like a slog, but hey, not everything has to age well. And I truly think the feedback for this game is a mix of valid criticism and the same negative reputation being echoed over time. It's not the worst game out there, but it's easy to see why, as a Metroid title, it became one of the most controversial. But now we return to Samus, three men down and Adam has gone radio silent. Worried that the deleter is hunting him down, Samus runs into the young woman again, this time revealing herself as Dr. Madeline Bergman, the scientist behind the bioweapons research. From here the game starts dumping plot twist after plot twist. First bombshell, the Federation ordered this ship to capture and experiment on space pirates, adding cybernetics to transform them into a special forces army. Predictably, that plan backfired, with Ridley rallying the pirates instead. You okay, so that was a stupid plan. What else we got? What? That's not possible. The Metroids were terminated along with Zebus. Of course they tried to breed Metroids. Turns out the Federation stole baby Metroid juice from Samus's suit to kickstart this experiment, and during this process, it spawned a new Ridley. Alright, what else you got, Dr. Bergman? Control Metroids. You need Mother Brain's telepathy. You didn't recreate a Mother Brain clone, did you? 
It's artificial intelligence. We called it MB. You what? Yeah, so they also decided, why not recreate an AI based on Mother Brain? They weren't even subtle about this naming convention, by the way. MB? So dumb decision after dumb decision, they deserved everything that was happening on this ship. Anyway, MB and the Metroids are stored in an area called Sector Zero. But with one last bombshell, the doctor tells Samus that Adam signed off on the entire project. So let's go find him and blast a hole in him. <laughs> Alright, well, that happens too. So on her way to Sector Zero, Samus runs into a baby Metroid and gets all mommy with it before she decides to kill it. But she's ambushed by Adam, who manages to disable her suit somehow, and then he eliminates the Metroid himself. And he explains that these versions are resistant to ice, because of course they are. But Adam clarifies he was against the project the whole time. A small faction of the Federation managed to get the project approved, so to atone, he's going right into Sector Zero and is going to self-destruct himself to eliminate all the bad things in there. Oh, and he disabled Samus's suit because he didn't want her going in herself. He cares. I'm just kidding, this does not redeem him for me. Adam's final orders? Secure the survivor in room MW and take down the new Ridley. He enters Sector Zero and blows it to pieces, good riddance. Side note, we only see Sector Zero detach from the bottle ship, it doesn't explode on screen, so I'm not sure if they just left the room open for him to come back, hopefully not. So with Samus finishing the mission, she discovers the identity of the deleter. <laughs> James Pierce from the 7th Platoon, but he's dead now. Along with him are the remains of Ridley. A bit anticlimactic, but we notice there is yet another survivor running around. But before Samus can secure them, a whole ass queen Metroid is here that she has to take down. This is who packed up Ridley and James, by the way. It's like they wanted all the classic enemies to return to one game, but had no clue how to get them all into one place. But after defeating the queen Metroid, Samus discovers the remaining survivor was the real Dr. Madeline Bergman all along. So if you're the real doctor, who the hell were we talking to this entire time? <clears throat> so strap in. The real Dr. Bergman is alive and was hiding all along. The young woman from earlier was actually the android embodiment of MB, the rogue AI. I mean, you used the genetic material of an already corrupt AI to build this thing. What did you think was going to happen? So this android of MB is so powerful, it telepathically ordered the space pirate experiments on the ship to turn against the researchers and continue propagating Metroids in Sector Zero. During the conversation, MB confronts the two and it sets the stage for an epic final battle, I'm sure. Federation reinforcements arrive, MB summons every enemy aboard the ship, and you think, here it comes, the big one-on-one -on -one fight. Okay, mission complete, I guess. The fight suddenly ends, and the Federation Colonel thanks Samus for her service. Thankfully, Anthony Chattius Higgs, the MVP, returns her escort her back to her ship alive and well. I'm gonna be honest, after seeing this trailer, I did not think this dude would make it out alive. Praise be, you're the best, Anthony. I, I wish for you to come Remember back in me. another game soon. And just like that, the game ends. The pacing mirrors the narrative. Slow buildup followed by an abrupt sprint to the finish. But there is one last piece of unfinished business for Samus, though. Days later, Samus returns to the bottle ship to trigger its self-destruction sequence per the Federation's orders. Just as she's about to finish the job, she's ambushed by Fantoon, a surprise callback to Super Metroid. And honestly, it's a welcome fight, but it feels a little tacked on, like they realized they needed a true final boss. But either way, Fantoon felt like a nostalgic encore, one last burst of energy before Samus wipes away the mistakes of the past and starts anew. But was Fantoon lurking in the ship this whole time, or did he just pull up to the ship at the last minute? Either way, after defeating him, Samus retrieves Adam's helmet as a memento and initiates the self-destruct, wiping away the ship and all its corrupt experiments for good. What else can I really say about this ending? The marketing promised a deeper look into her character, but instead it left me feeling more disconnected from her. Maybe it was the opposite for some. This game tried to fill in narrative gaps that fans never asked for, and it didn't land well with the community, or Nintendo for that matter. As a result, the Metroid series entered a very long hiatus. Seven years, in fact, not counting that Federation Force spin-off. Before we talk about how they overcame that hiatus, let's rewind to 2002, when Nintendo released a game that would follow Other M chronologically and become one of the most beloved entries in the series. Metroid Fusion. Fusion was the first game to explore Samus's life after the events on Zebus. Metroid Fusion would push Samus into uncharted territory, one where her enemies weren't just lurking in the shadows, 
but inside her very own body. To grow strong, then you grow scared. Finally, we've arrived at Metroid Fusion. It returned Samus to the spotlight after an eight-year hiatus, launching alongside Metroid Prime to tackle both the portable and home console markets. Fusion is the definitive Metroid 4, and as I mentioned earlier, was the first title to pick up after the end of Super Metroid. The game opens with Samus narrating her return to the planet SR388 original home of the Metroids, and she serves as a bodyguard for another research team that wanted to investigate how the planet has been faring since Samus eradicated all the Metroids living there during the events of Metroid 2. Suddenly, this crazy Hornode attacks, and though Samus kills it, a weird yellow glorp thing comes out of it and finds its way inside Samus. There's actually a great callback to this very same Hornode that's feeding on Ridley at the end of Metroid Samus Returns, the 3DS remake of Metroid 2, which serves as a pretty good lead into this game. Anyway, Samus is feeling fine at first, and the researchers see their mission through, but on the way back to the lab orbiting the planet, Samus loses consciousness and crashes into an asteroid destroying her ship, but luckily it ejects her in time where she is recovered by a medical crew. The thing that entered her on SR388 turns out to be a dangerous parasitic organism named X. No, not that one. So during this narration, Samus gets into some interesting details about her and her suit's anatomy. To help save her, the medical crew had to surgically remove large parts of the suit itself as that was also infected. So I guess one thing I haven't covered in these videos so well is that the power suit, designed by the Chozo, is very much a part of Samus. Much like a turtle in its shell. A shell she can assimilate and dematerialize at will, but... The suit is very much bound to her biologically, and this is possible due to the Chozo DNA that's within her, given to her by her adopted Chozo family after she was orphaned. I guess this is one of those things you don't think too hard about, like what happens to Samus' skeleton when she turns into the Morph Ball. But this procedure isn't easy for the medical team, because Samus' connection to the suit. And to make matters worse, the X-Parasite has found its way into her nervous system. She now has less than a 1% chance of survival. And the only species that can counteract the X-Parasite? Yep, a Metroid. So in destroying all the Metroids, Samus directly caused an ecological disaster on SR388, with the X-Parasite having no more predators to control its population. And these things are the whole reason the Chozo created the Metroids in the first place, before the Metroids became the problem themselves. The old predator-prey conundrum. But there's some hope here. Remember those baby Metroid guts the Federation managed to harvest from Samus? The doctors use that to make an anti-X vaccine, and quickly use it on Samus, which eliminates the X within her, and saves her life. And due to this experimental vaccine, Samus is now immune to the X, but not only that, she can absorb them to replenish her energy. So at this point, Samus is this mutated human experiment. Part Chozo, part human, and part Metroid? Well here's the thing, now that she has Metroid DNA within her, she's now extremely vulnerable to the cold. This is also reflected in the look of her suit, which changed drastically, and Samus reflects on this being a moment where she was reborn, owing the baby Metroid thanks for saving her life a second time. It seems like a somewhat happy ending here, but the game hasn't even started yet. There's this big explosion at the Biologic Space Labs, the place where her infected suit and the specimens they gathered from SR388 were being held and studied. Feeling somewhat better, Samus hops into her new ship and goes to investigate, and it's immediately apparent that the lab is compromised. The X are now running amok within it, infecting every creature aboard. Samus is briefed on all this by her new AI and her ship, but that's not the only bad news. The X can also replicate themselves to make copies of the prey they infect. So this gives the game an excuse to have monsters littered throughout the ship, and Samus, who is missing large parts of her suit, is back to square one. But let's talk about her new AI companion for a second. Samus will mention that it speaks in a very similar fashion to Adam. Yes, Adam Malkovich. So internally, she names the AI Adam. But this is technically Adam's first in-game appearance, which is how fans would first learn about the original Adam Malkovich. And funny enough, this AI paints a better picture of him than Other M did. But there's no time for all of that. Samus needs to contain this incident now. So her first order of business is to strengthen herself once again by finding missiles and other upgrades around the ship. So now the game opens up for the player to start exploring, and as Samus heads deeper into the research labs, we get a horrifying reveal. I 
hate that this thing literally looks directly at you. It's very unsettling. Adam will warn Samus that this incredibly powerful entity is an ex-parasite that used the parts of Samus' suit to become this abomination. And now it walks about the station, hunting her down, knowing that she's a threat to the survival of the ex-parasites. They call it the SAX, which took me 22 years to realize it comes from the name Samus Aaron X. You stupid! Anyway, since this parasite was born from Samus' powered up suit, it's more powerful than her at this moment in time, so as you progress through the game, you can only avoid it which leads to some horrifying moments. The SAX doesn't just exist to spook you in cutscenes, it's stalking you throughout the game, turning each sector into a nightmare as you're forced to hide and avoid its power. One wrong step and it will fold you. I guess this goes to show how powerful Samus really is if this is a copy of her fully powered form. And it's used sparingly enough where it doesn't overstay its welcome, because when you're playing this for the first time, you just have no idea when it's going to pop up. It's genuinely terrifying. So if Metroid is initially influenced by Alien and the Xenomorphs within that film, you could say that SAX and the X-Parasites can be compared to John Carpenter's The Thing, a creature that's able to assimilate and imitate other organisms. There's no developer stories that give a direct shout out to this influence, but it's pretty damn obvious. So this seems like a pretty bad situation, but there is still hope. Samus can absorb X-Parasites to boost her own strength. So her goal is to explore the labs, hunting down and stopping powerful X-Specimens to further enhance her powers. Which I will say works very well narratively, because I'm sure there's no Chozo statues around this station to help her power up her suit. Nintendo R&D 1 would be responsible for the development of Metroid Fusion, with Yoshio Sakamoto making his return to the Metroid franchise after 8 years. He'd write and direct this title, originally dubbed Metroid 4. Many mechanics remain relatively unchanged since Super Metroid, but this time, Samus can defeat enemies and then absorb the parasite within them to stop it from cloning itself into another monster. And in doing so, Samus can absorb health or replenish her ammo. And while they developed this game, Sakamoto and the team wanted to raise the stakes, incorporating animated cutscenes into the game that drove the story forward. But there's one Nintendo character in particular that we owe this game to, and that's Wario. Yes, funny enough, this game has deep connections to Wario Land 4. Nintendo R&D 1 were responsible for creating Wario Land 4 and on the Game Boy Advance as well. And since the programmers at that time never worked previously on a Metroid game, they had to use the development techniques they learned during the creation of that game to bring us Metroid Fusion. Sakamoto has said, Metroid Fusion was the first attempt by the Wario series development team at making a Metroid game. I have a vivid memory of writing an explanation of level design on paper and showing it to each of the level designers for them to understand what made Metroid tick. As a result, we received an amazing Metroid game, with this title getting universal praise upon release. This actually was my second Metroid game after Super Metroid, and I still love this one a lot. It might be a little bit more linear than most Metroid titles before it, but this one comes off as a survival horror. Samus is weakened this time around, and with that awesome narrative at the beginning setting the stage, you feel vulnerable and crippled at the very start of this game. It's hard to explain without playing it yourself, but it gives this added sense of urgency and danger as you scramble to survive this new, unique, and dangerous threat while this nightmare stalks you through the halls. I recommend this one to anyone who has the slightest inkling to play because it's an experience. So we return to Samus who's making good progress destroying the X. But before we go on, there's one interesting callback to Super Metroid. At a specific point in the game, survivors will be detected in the habitation deck. And when you head there, you'll see some familiar faces. The animal Samus rescued from Zebus during her escape at the end of Super Metroid. At least, I hope you saved them. Their official names are Etacoons and Datras. But as Samus's stressful journey continues, the plot gets thick. We find out someone from the Federation has been contacting the AI Adam, asking if Samus suspects anything and asks it to keep monitoring her. The Federation just keeps taking L's at this point because it's not long before the truth comes to light. They are once again trying to breed Metroids in the deepest part of this lab, and Samus discovers several of them being held in a restricted laboratory and naturally, this freaks out the SAX seeing its number one enemy is on this ship. Due to the Metroids breaking free, the lab locks down and decouples itself from the station as a defense mechanism, with Samus escaping by the skin of her teeth. And Adam expresses some anger over this revelation, telling Samus the Federation were trying to breed Metroids for the greater good, with them figuring out ways to have them rapidly mature in a matter of days. And I'm not sure why anyone would need an Omega Metroid like this for peaceful applications, but this AI doesn't know any better, so I'll give it a pass. 
But with one threat dealt with, another rears its ugly head. The SAX has been replicating, leaving Samus to now deal with multiple hunting her down. And as she tries to make her way out, she encounters a longtime friend, Ridley. Again! Or actually, Neo Ridley. An ex-clone of Ridley copied from his frozen corpse that was on the station. So wait, how is that even possible? Ridley should have been dusted on Zebus. For a long time, people were wondering how Ridley even got into this lab, but with the release of Other M, it would be explained that this corpse we see is what was left of the reborn Ridley from Other M, presumably recovered from the bottle ship. So near Ridley here would be a clone of a clone? Regardless, timeline-wise, as of this video, this is the last we've seen of Ridley. After three videos of covering this guy coming back over and over again, it's kind of sad to say goodbye. Anyway, this poor AI continues to defy Samus, telling her she should just leave everything to the Federation, who is already thinking of ways to use the ex-parasites on board, for once again, peaceful applications. On the other hand, Samus wants to blow up the whole station to eliminate the ex, but Adam locks her in the room after receiving orders from the Federation to contain her, leading to Samus yelling at the computer as it's actually Adam, which has this AI asking who the hell is Adam, so Samus reveals that Adam gave his life to save her, which we would later see fully explained in Other M. But after being moved by this story, she convinces AI Adam to help her. And together, they decide to take the self-destruction plan a step further. Instead, they'll alter the orbit of the entire research station to take out planet SR-388 along with it. So at this stage of the game, it's clear Samus just likes to blow things up. But during this exchange, we also learn that the computer doesn't just sound like Adam. It's his whole personality that was uploaded into the computer itself. Any objections, lady? But either way, Adam Malkovich lives on with us for as long as this series exists. Hooray. So Samus goes forward to execute the plan, but this time, there's no hiding. She takes it head on. And despite defeating this one, she's unable to absorb the ex-parasite within it. But the mission must continue. So after activating the self-destruct sequence, you'll have to rush back to her ship in typical Metroid fashion. Only this time, it's missing. In its place is an Omega Metroid, and with no ice beam on her, Samus finds herself in grave trouble. But suddenly, she gets unexpected help from the SAX, who I guess will always see the Metroids as a greater threat than anything else. But being weakened from their battle, the SAX is quickly dispatched by the Omega Metroid, which gives Samus the opportunity to absorb it unlocking her Omega suit and the Ice Beam along with it. So the final fight for the game is taking down the Omega Metroid, clearing the way for Samus to escape. And it's somewhat poetic, even though the X are introduced as this new highly dangerous threat, the final showdown for Metroid Fusion is with a Metroid, the apex predator of this series. But once the Metroid goes down, Samus' ship comes to pick her up, piloted by Adam, and surprise, remember the Edekuns and Dacheras that you should have saved? They're here too! So with everyone escaping safely, the station crashes into SR-388, ridding the galaxy of the ex-parasite and Metroid threats for good. But once again, Samus takes the time to reflect, believing no one would really understand her reasoning for eradicating the ex. The game ends on one final quote from her, We are all bound by our experiences. There are the limits of our consciousness, but in the end, the human soul will ever reach for the truth. This is what Adam taught me. Oh, you had to go and ruin it at the end. So with this game warmly received by fans and Metroid Prime at the same time serving as this renaissance for Metroid, it is no wonder they went all in with a deeper narrative experience with Metroid Other M. Intending to give a more perspective on Samus' character while simultaneously setting the stage for a new adventure for Samus after the events of Fusion. But with the mixed reception from Other M, this wouldn't exactly go as planned. The best way to escape an impending threat? the bigger threat. Seven long years between Metroid Other M and Samus's next adventure, Metroid Samus Returns. While Samus Returns is a remake of Metroid 2, it didn't advance Samus's story chronologically. However, this game marked a much needed return to form, with Spanish studio Mercury Steam collaborating with Yoshio Sakamoto to evolve the 2D Metroid formula. Notably, this was the first 2D Metroid since Metroid Zero Mission for the Game Boy Advance in 2004 itself a stunning remake of the original Metroid. 
Mercury Steam was no stranger to the genre, having previously developed Castlevania Lords of Shadow Mirror of Fate for the 3DS in 2013. Eager to tackle a Metroid game, they pitched a remake of Metroid Fusion. And as much as I would have loved to see that, Sakamoto felt Metroid 2 needed the remake treatment more. So from there, the collaboration took off and Samus Returns became a reality. So from there, it was off to the races and after seven years of fans starving along with their disappointment for Metroid Prime Federation Force, this was a welcomed addition to the franchise, though some projects like AM2R had to get snuffed out along the way. Maybe I should cover that game someday, I've never had a chance to play it. Slight tangent here, but since this is the end of my Metroid mini-series, I just wanted to gauge your interest in me diving further into some of these in more detail. I had to cut out a lot of the details you'd see in a deeper dive for some of these games, so if there's interest in that, just let me know in the comments below. But of course, when Metroid Prime 4 drops, I'm gonna be there to cover it as well. So after having such a successful collaboration with Mercury Steam, Sakamoto felt confident to bring them into the ring for the next, and as of this video, the latest chapter, in Samus's story. Metroid Dread, released for the Nintendo Switch in 2021. But the history of this game goes back almost 16 years. Metroid Dread was first teased back in 2005 as a sequel to Metroid Fusion, but the project stalled due to technical limitations and Sakamoto's dissatisfaction with early prototypes. Over the years, rumors and hints like the infamous space pirate log in Metroid Prime 3 kept fans hopeful, but the game was shelved until technology caught up with the vision. This space pirate log, by the way, opened up Pandora's box. Experiment status report update. Metroid Project Dread is nearing the final stages of completion. Turns out this wasn't really a reference and Nintendo tried to tailor expectations here by continuing to deny the existence of Dread. But everyone was like, yeah, right, you're, you're just trying not to reveal it. But the truth was, yes, this game wasn't close to getting off the ground. But the damage from that space pirate log had already been done and journalists began asking more questions, with Mark Pacini, the director of Metroid Prime 3, saying it was merely coincidental. They doubled down on this by making sure the Japanese version, which released a year after, altered the message to refer to Project Dread instead as a Dread-class turret. So despite fan speculation, Nintendo repeatedly denied that Dread was in development. Which brings us back to 2017 Samus Returns. While it sticks closely to its roots as a remake of Metroid 2, there's some added lore that players can unlock depending on their completion rate, which offers a detailed glimpse into the history of the Chozo civilization on SR388, the ones responsible for creating the Metroids. Through this beautifully illustrated artwork, we learn about the Chozo's struggle to control the X-Parasites, leading them to create the Metroids as a biological weapon. But once the X-Threat was neutralized, the Metroids themselves spiraled out of control. And while some of this information had already been touched on in the manual for Metroid Fusion, Samus Returns takes it a step further, filling in gaps we didn't know existed, especially regarding the fate of the Chozo. As players unlock more of these memories, one particular image stands out, depicting a Chozo striking down a leader. This internal conflict hinted at something deeper going on within their ranks, sparking rampant speculation among fans about what might come next for the series. It seemed inevitable that Samus would eventually have to confront the Chozo in some capacity. So as fans were itching for news on Metroid Prime 4, during the Nintendo Direct in June 2021, we received this surprise reveal. Finally, after 16 long years of anticipation, Metroid Dread was revealed in 2021. And the best part? It came out just four months later. Clearly, Sakamoto and his team took note of the lessons from Metroid Other M, delivering a plot that's straight to the point. The story kicks off this time with Samus receiving intel that the X-Parasite threat isn't as eradicated as everyone hoped. The Galactic Federation detected signs of the parasite on a remote planet called ZDR and knowing their usual tactics aren't up to par, they send in their latest high-tech solution, the Extraplanetary Multiform Mobile Identifiers, or EMIs for short. Cutting-edge surveillance robots, and seven of them are dispatched to ZDR, but predictably, contact is lost. Whoops, better call Samus. I'll call now. So as our ship approaches ZDR, we're reunited with AI Adam, who's still alive and well. And he even complains that the pay doesn't seem worth the mission. Classic Adam. But I have to admit, hearing his robotic voice for the first time was a bit of a surprise after only knowing him through text in Fusion. But we see Samus awaking on ZDR with a new look, the effects of the Metroid vaccine more pronounced here than in Fusion, 
What once looked like blue slime on her body now appears as tightly wrapped muscle fibers, blending biological and cybernetic elements in this slick new design. But something's off. Why was she unconscious? She quickly recalls that before blacking out, she encountered an unexpected visitor. A Chozo, alive and in the flesh, and well, they waste no time. Despite her skills, he completely overpowers her, draining much of her suit's power. So Adam debriefs Samus on the situation, and her mission is clear. Reach the surface and make it back to her ship. But it won't be easy. The planet is hostile, with dangerous fauna, cold environments that her Metroid DNA makes her vulnerable to. And one more thing. Yeah, so on the bright side, we found the Emmys. The bad news? They've clearly been hacked. And in her current state, Samus can't even take down a damaged one. Fortunately, she stumbles upon an AI unit, which, after draining its gross brain thing, grants her temporary access to the Omega Cannon. And let me tell you, this thing is powerful. One shot from this cannon obliterates the first Emmy. But this is just a small victory that doesn't last very long. It's clear that this situation isn't good. But the gameplay is... This quickly became one of my favorite Metroid games of all time. The Emmys are this persistent threat throughout Dread, and while the Omega Cannon gives you a brief reprieve, these moments are rare and fleeting. But outside of those encounters, Samus is left pretty vulnerable. Relying on the classic Metroid formula of exploration, platforming, and upgrades, like the Phantom Cloak, which allows Samus to temporarily become invisible, adding this new layer of stealth tactics against the Emmys. The fear-based gameplay that Sakamoto talked about is at the heart of Dread, building on those stealth elements introduced in Fusion with the SAX. But this time, the Emmys are the hunters. In specific zones, they patrol for Samus, forcing you to use every tool at your disposal. They can track her movements, detect sounds, and they can even crawl through tight spaces. Until you manage to power up the Omega Cannon again, it's a game of cat and mouse. And you're definitely the mouse. No pun intended, but this sense of dread is real, as just hearing the beeping from them gets your heart pounding. If they catch you, there's this brief nail-biting moment where you can escape with a perfectly timed counterattack, but trust me, it's tough to pull off. Despite the tense, heart-pounding encounters, the gameplay itself is incredibly polished. It feels like a return to basics. Movement is fluid, and Samus can slide under gaps now, perform melee counters, and the control responsiveness feels tighter than ever before. With these mechanics combined, combat flows smoothly, making the boss fights intense, challenging, and in my opinion, extremely badass. So Samus tries to make her way out, grabbing upgrades along the way until we see a familiar but welcomed face. Ridley. Just kidding, this time it's Kraid! It's been so long since their last encounter, but here he is, chained up like some pet. And Samus pretends like she's not excited to see him, come on, you know you want to catch up. But Kraid is easily bested, with Samus almost being disrespectful with him here. And can I say this is probably my favorite portrayal of Samus throughout the whole series. She doesn't sit around to ask questions, her body language is ridiculously confident. And overall, she's brutal in this game. The way she finishes off some of these opponents like they don't make her break a single sweat. This feels like the galaxy's greatest bounty hunter right here. It's worth playing this game just to see her embarrass her enemies. I know I mentioned in my Prime video that body language was huge in those games, but they take it up another notch in Dread. And I hope they stick to this trend in future titles, because less is definitely more here. But as Samus continues her journey, she's overpowered by one of the Emmys, but is saved by a Chozo, who we learn is named Quiet Rope. He tells her that the Chozo, Samus faced earlier, was named Ravenbeak, and we finally get some clarity of what went down on SR388. Turns out there were two Chozo tribes on that planet, the Thoha, a science-focused tribe that created the Metroids, and the Makin, a warrior tribe. And these two teamed up to round up the Metroids and keep them under control, but Ravenbeak, who's part of the Makin tribe of course, had other plans. He wants to use the Metroids for his own agenda and straight up massacred the Thoha, Quiet Robe is the lone survivor forced to work with Ravenbeak and his crew due to their ability to pacify Metroids. They scouted ZDR as the new Metroid home, but in typical Metroid fashion, things went sideways when one of the Mockin soldiers turned out to be infected with the X Parasite. So, mass infection, chaos, you know the drill. And by the time they contained the X, it was already too late. Samus had wiped out all the Metroids they were planning to harvest from SR388. Well, that sucks for them. So, Ravenbeak's new plan? 
Lure Samus to ZDR and extract her Metroid DNA to create a new army of Metroids. Hell yeah. This is Samus's one and only voice line within this game, and man, it's so powerful. Just really cements her deep connection to the Chozo, a side of her we don't see very often, too. But after all of that, Quiet Robe gets got. And what a way to ruin the moment. Read the room, my guy. And also, remember that X infestation that was contained by Ravenbeak? He decides, screw it, let's release them into the planet. So that's yet another thing Samus has to deal with, but she still has the ability to absorb the X, which was a welcome call back to Fusion. But despite all this, there's something going on with Samus. Adam will let her know that her Metroid powers are awakening. The DNA within her is beginning to evolve and she's becoming a Metroid. The only reason this didn't happen sooner is because of the Chozo DNA within her. Adam clarifies that Samus must have a mixture of Thoha and Machin DNA within her and then starts saying some questionable shit. Destiny Samus, this is an order. Disobedience will not be tolerated. Snooping as usual, I see. So it turns out it is Ravenbeak impersonating Adam the whole time. Classic twist. But here's the kicker. Samus finally learns the truth. The Chozo DNA inside her? That came from Ravenbeak himself. So he basically tells her, I'm your daddy. We assume that Thoha DNA came from Grey Voice, one of the Chozo who adopted her in the manga, but who knows, maybe they'll switch up on this in a future game. But after this touching reunion, the two fight to the death, as I'm sure all father-daughter reunions go. This fight is intense. Multiple phases, each more brutal than the last. Ravenbeak has his own arm cannon and matches Samus blow for blow. This is gaming right here. But after all of this, Ravenbeak still has Samus on the ropes and has no qualms in killing her because he says he can just clone an army of her instead. So we've come full circle. Samus is now the lethal, highly sought out alien species that everyone wants to breed. The Rule 34 artists out there have already proven this. But during this fool's monologue, Samus fully awakens her Metroid powers and bodies Ravenbeak, like fully drains this guy, and his fortress crashes. So Samus, now a full-on Metroid warrior, intends to finish off Ravenbeak, but this ex-parasite takes the opportunity to infect him and try to end Samus itself. This is where we see her sheer insect mommy power. She can just vaporize anything at this point, it's crazy. And Ravenbeak easily goes down. So with him dealt with, it's time to head back to the ship as ZDR begins to self-destruct. And this time though, there are no limits to Samus here. She has this endless Gallic gun at her disposal and it's awesome. But when she finally gets to the ship, Adam advises against touching it because she would drain all of its energy with her Metroid powers. Quiet Robe, you're alive? Oh wait, this is an ex-Parasite clone? So my guy was such a chill person that even his ex-version was passive. Either way, he forces Samus to absorb him, seemingly calming down her Metroid powers with his additional Thoha genes, and she safely evacuates ZDR as it explodes. And I've been keeping count, this is the fourth planet Samus has destroyed by the way. And then the credits roll. And based on your difficulty and how quickly you beat the game, you do get some really awesome artwork covering all parts of the series. But what's next for Samus then? This feels like a bookend to a long time saga between Samus, the Metroids, Space Pirates, Chozo, and X-Parasites. And at the end of this game, Samus seems like the most ridiculously powerful person in the galaxy right now, so where does the series go from here? As of this video, the only thing on the horizon is Metroid Prime 4 Beyond, which will likely fit somewhere earlier in the timeline alongside the other Prime games. So for Samus' future, Sakamoto isn't done yet. He's confirmed that Dread isn't the final chapter for her story. While it was meant to wrap up the arc between her and the Metroids, there's already another game in the works. He's even said, quote, as long as the character Samus exists, I think her adventure will continue. There should be something that is able to continue the franchise and the universe, so yes. As long as your character Samus is loved, I would like to do what I have to do. So where Metroid goes next is anyone's guess, but the galaxy is vast and full of secrets. And with those secrets come threats lurking in the dark. So when the time comes, Samus Aran, the greatest bounty hunter in the cosmos, will be ready.